trivia. Did you know that the sun produces more energy in one second than we have used in the entire history of the world? And our sun, which is the closest star, is burning so fast that they believe it will only burn for another 30 billion years. Wow, that's power. Astronomers tell us that there are 200 billion trillion stars burning suns throughout the universe. And every one of them, to the various degrees, is burning just as hot, some even hotter. That is a tremendous amount of power until you compare it with the God who created the sun and the stars. We've been looking at God's knowledge, and it's okay to say He knows everything. That's, that's cool. We've been looking at God's presence, and we struggled a little bit, a little bit saying, God never has to go anywhere. He's always there. But today we come to God's power. And we're going to learn something different than we have the past two weeks. Jeremiah says, Sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arms. Nothing's too hard for you. We're talking today what the theologians call the omnipotence of God. God has unlimited power. Never gets tarred. Nothing's ever too difficult. And the natural place you see that, I think, is in creation. Creation is the witness every day, every moment of God's power. Look at the mountains of Tennessee or West Virginia or in the Rockies, wherever. You see God's greatness. You look out at that star-filled sky in the evening and you see Millions of light years in every direction, and God is beyond all of that, and at the same time, within all of that. David says, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display His craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make Him known. The Bible says the universe was created simply because God spoke it into a happening. He said, let there be light, and there was light. He said, let there be water, and all of a sudden there were lakes and oceans and rivers. He said, let there be fish, and all of a sudden all these waters sprang forth with life. He said, let there be stars, and the universe was filled with the suns and stars. That's power. It's an amazing amount of power. Everywhere you go and everywhere you look, even any field, any field of science, especially biology, you will see that this is an incredibly complex place. Way back when, they, they had this theory that says everything started with really simple stuff and worked its way up to the really complicated stuff. But over the past 20, 30, 40 years, whatever, our scientists are learning that life is complicated here. And even down here with the simple stuff, it is biologically, molecularly just as complicated. Everywhere you look, there's a design. Everything has an order and a shape or a flow. And you know, when you have a design that just sort of says, there's a designer. Someone created this design. Random chance is just not going to cut it. It's not powerful enough. I honestly believe, and, and I have believed this uh, pretty much all of my life, that it will take you more faith to be an atheist than to be a believer in God. I mean, look at Jesus. He had the very power of God. He had the power over nature. He calmed the storm. He just told the waves to be still. He spoke to a tree and it died. Another time, he turned water into wine. He had power over disease and death. He healed the blind, lame, and sick. He even raised the dead. He had the power over the devil. You remember that story? There was one time a bunch of demons in this man. And Jesus kicked him out of the man into a herd of pigs and vented deviled ham. 
God's power is awesome. <laughs> I'll give you a moment to catch up. That one up. <laughs> All right. But here's the difference. Here is the difference between the last two messages we've shared. God wants to share his power with you. Now, you don't get to know everything. You don't get to be every place. But he is willing to share the power. Listen to what Paul writes. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the place of honor in God's right hand in the heavenly realm. Now, I know you guys absolutely love Greek lessons, and so I'm going to spare you part of this. But there's two words that are underlined there. That last one, greatness, is a word that's not found in the Bible anywhere else. This is the only time it happens. It's also among the people back then who spoke Greek, it's not a word that they would normally use. This is one of those big words, this academic kind of stuff that we don't always understand the big words. But Paul is grasping and searching for just a powerful enough word to describe this greatness. And in a way, you could almost call it mega great, or mega, mega, mega great. And that's not enough. That wasn't enough for him. He had to put that word incredibly in front of it. And that's not just a usual word for incredible. This is a very special word that says they're getting ready to throw the javelins into the target. And this guy throws it. And he clears the target by 40, 50, 60 more foot. It's a super throw, a super over and above. It would take up a whole paragraph, but I hope you're getting the idea of what Paul is saying. God's power is beyond measure. It's over and above mega, mega great. It's beyond any expectations of great. And then he says, you can share it. God wants to share his power with you. Now, honestly, I can think of two special places where we need it. Now, number one is when we try to get started. I think we all have this problem. I do, all, all the time. Let me just ask you this way. How many good things have you planned to do and have postponed over the past six months? Yeah, I know. I'm right there with you. What is it that you need to do and you just can't start? What would you like to do? What would you like to change about yourself? But you just can't get enough motivation. You ever find yourself paralyzed by procrastination? Happens all the time. Even the Apostle Paul. Listen to what he writes in Romans 7. I often find that I have the will to do good, but not the power. I mean, does that describe you? Me? You want to do what's right. You want to do what's good. You, you just don't have the power. Well, here's some good news that's in your Bible, just like it's in mine. For God's working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. God says, I want to give you the desire, and I'll give you the power. And the second thing that comes to my mind just right off the bat is, not just the power to get going, but the power to stay with it for a little while. Uh, all of us have been there. A lot of us are great starters. We start it, go two weeks, and then we're done. Because, you know, it's, it's another thing to do what you want to do when you don't feel like doing what it is you want to do. God says, well, I'm willing to give you the power to start, I'm also willing to give you the power to keep on going. You can probably relate to this verse from David. I am worn out, O Lord. Have pity on me. Give me strength. I'm completely exhausted and my whole being is deeply troubled. Some days that's my life verse. And life verse is a verse that describes everything that's happening in your life. Well, some days my life verse is I'm just too tired. <laughs> I need to read what Isaiah writes. Don't you know, 
Haven't you heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. He created the world and He never grows tired or weary. He strengthened those who are weak and tired. Those who trust in the Lord for help will find their strength renewed. They will rise up on wings like eagles. They will run and not get weary. They will walk and not grow weak. Isn't that an awesome promise? God's power is unlimited. He never gets tired. He never gets weary. And no matter how drained or exhausted we might be, it's a possibility we can tap into that kind of power. Now, being the negative kind of guy that I am on some days, I know what you're thinking. Well, that might work for you, but it doesn't work for me. I've been a Christian for 87 years, and, and I've never seen God do any of that stuff for me. And I kind of would be right there and share some of those thoughts with you. Because I believe that most Christians don't tap into the power of God. I think it's one of those areas that all of us struggle with. And you ask yourself, then, why don't Christians get this power of God if it's so offered so readily and freely? And the simple answer is it doesn't come automatically. There are some things you got to do to get ready for it. Now, I know there are a million books out there, and there are probably a million web pages where somebody somewhere is going to write about how can you get the power of God, and how do you know you have the power of God, and it might take us a month or two to even read three or four of those books. But I want to just take it down to the basics. Very bottom first foundational steps. Three things that I think we all just need to pay attention to. Number one, admit that you're not God. Admit that you don't have the power. You know, admit that you don't have it all together. One of our many, many problems is that we do think we're God. We believe we can handle anything. We believe we can do anything. Tell the truth. You came out of high school thinking that you could do anything in this world. Then after a few years, you discovered you didn't have the power to do that. And you start, you were introduced to some things called stress and tension and frustration and discouragement. You had a midlife crisis somewhere along the way because you simply woke up one day and realized you can't do it all that you weren't God. You can't control life. No matter how much you think you can, you can't control what happens. And you are not going to reach every goal you thought you were going to reach. You are not going to make as much money as you thought you were going to wind up with. You heard Paul talk about his thorn in the flesh. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. It's something we kind of think it was a problem with his eyes. Not sure, but that's, you know, a good possibility. But it's, it bothered him a lot. But in talking about that one day to the church at Corinth, he gives us a big, big secret about God's power. Just It's a long verse, but listen. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. He said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. And that's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and difficulties. For when I am weak, I am strong. Now, I've got to tell you, that's a tough verse to understand. There's a lot of stuff in there, and I'm, I'm not there completely with Paul. But this much is obvious. It is in the moments of weakness that we truly are the candidates for power. When you're honest about your weakness, then you're ready to learn a little bit more about God's power. If you still want to pretend that you have it all together, you kind of short-circuit the power. 
Number two, very simple. You need to believe all that we've said today about God's power. You need to at least put it into perspective that if there is a God and if he created it all, then that is a pretty awesome, powerful job of creation. Paul would write this, God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. God is able to do more than you can even imagine. No, not just more than you can imagine, it's as measurably more than you can imagine. The secret, of course, is do you really believe that? I think that's the second key. It's called faith. Part of the definition of faith is this. Faith is what you believe. And a lot of it depends and starts with what do you believe about God? How much power really is available? Was he telling the truth when he says he'd be happy to share some? Unfortunately, though, sometimes we just make it intellectual. Oh, yes, I believe in the power of God. But it's got to go beyond intellectual to heartfelt. It's got to go into confidence and conviction in those areas of the heart. Because you see, another thing that will short circuit this route to power is doubt. The first time we say that if you think you're God, that's going to short circuit it right there. But the more doubts that you have, the more that that's going to short circuit it again. You say, well, what are you talking about? An example. Oh, yes, I believe what God's power can do in the church. But our church is so small and so weak and we don't have much money. And that's called a short circuit to God's power. Yes, I believe God heals broken lives and broken marriages all the time. But man, our problems are so bad. We fight all the time. Yes, I want God to help me change my life. Well, I can't change all these bad habits. That's just who I am. <laughs> and so that's the second big problem is, is we may intellectually believe the power, but we short-circuit it right out with our little excuses. Now, number three, act on your beliefs. I said faith is what you believe. That's not enough. I have to add some more words. Faith is what you believe and put into practice. It does not become faith until you believe it and put it into practice or obey it, as I said. Now, there's a passage in the Old Testament that tells this story better than I can. So let me just tell you that one. Joshua and the children of Israel are getting ready to come into the promised land again. They have to cross the Jordan River. It's kind of like Moses and the Red Sea, but it's a different year. And it's Joshua. And the whole nation has to cross. It's probably a million people. And they have to pass the Jordan River, which at this time of the year is just swollen, overflowing, and, and actually very deep and dangerous. And so God tells this to Joshua. He says, take the leaders. Remember that word. Take the leaders and put them <laughs> out front of the people and tell them to walk into the river. And after they begin to walk into the river, I'll dam it up a little way north. The waters will recede and you'll be able to walk across on dry land. Now, were you one of those leaders, what would you be thinking? And this might be a good devotion for leaders, huh? You remember what they did, if you ever heard the story? Well, the priests actually go into the swollen river, just like God said. And this is what happens. As soon as the priest stepped into the river, the water stopped flowing. Get it? The miracle didn't happen until the people took the first step. You see this all over the Bible. I, I, I'm amazed that we don't see and talk about it more often. This is critical. God's people have to act in faith. 
You have to step out on some occasions, if not all occasions, before the power shows up. God wants you to take action even before you ever feel like acting. Now this is crazy. Because you're thinking, and you should be thinking this, you mean that I have to act like I have the power even though I don't have the power so I can get the power. <laughs> yeah, isn't that the craziest thing you've ever heard? It's called acting in faith. Some places the Bible calls it living by faith. It's simply as living every day, assuming that God is going to provide His blessings or whatever you need. And when you finally step out first in advance, before you even feel it, God sees your faith. I mean, don't wait for the feelings. Do the acting feelings will catch up. You need to do those things that you know are right, even though you don't feel like it quite yet. Immaturity is trying to live by your feelings. It's a tough way to live because one day you're up, the next day you're down. That's life. Maturity is living by your commitments. Some of you are waiting for God to do a miracle in your life, and you think you're waiting for God to do it. Reality is God is most likely waiting on you to start. He's waiting on you to take the first step. And His power is not going to be released until you take that first step. Now here's the bottom line today. What good is it to talk about the God being all-powerful if we never take advantage of it? You and I are going to need God's power this week. The Bible says He loves to share it with you. So, good question is, what are you expecting God to do this week? Anything? What are you expecting God to do in your church this week? We just live with so little power when so much more is available to us. You want power, admit you're not God. Believe that God will act in your life. And then go ahead and start living as if God's going to do it. It is not our usual way of living, but it's God's way, and who knows, it might make a difference in the way we live as well. Would you stand as we share a final song this morning?